Well, today I have a message that uh, it's nothing new. You've heard it before, I know. <laughs> if you've been around as long as I have, you've pretty much heard them all, I think. <clears throat> Uh, I want to speak about studying the Bible. The, the title of my message is Rules for Effective Bible Study. And I, uh, I have uh, five rules that I'd like to give you, and uh, there could be more. And uh, maybe you can think yourself of five that are better than the ones I have. But nonetheless, I'll give you the five that I've come up with. You know, Bible study is one of the most important things we can do <clears throat> as Christians. And the reason why is because the Bible is the Word of God. <clears throat> it's like God speaking to us. And uh, we should look at it that way. My number one rule is treat the Bible with reverence as the inspired Word of God. Because it is. It is the inspired Word of God. So if you'd like to turn to us, Second Timothy, uh, chapter 3. Timothy, as you know, near the end of the Bible there. Second Timothy <clears throat> 3 and verse 16 and again, I, uh, I hope all of you have read this before, probably many times. It's a, it's a fundamental scripture. Paul said to Timothy <clears throat> and to the church there and the church at large, all scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what does it mean that the scripture is inspired by God? Well, Green's literal translation puts it this way. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine and so on. He uses the word God breathe. The reason why he uses that is because that word, that Greek word is made up of, of uh, two words, theos, which means God, and pneuma, which means spirit or breath. And in this case, it means breath. It means the breath of God. The breath of God <coughs> is speaking these things in a sense. So that's what it means to be inspired by God. So therefore, we need to think deeply about these things when we study the Bible. It's not, it's not just a book. It's, it's not a novel. It's not a book that we can take lightly, but it's, a, it's God speaking to us. It, remember, it's inspired, God breathed. If you'd like to turn to Acts 17, 11, I, uh, I actually wrote the uh, scripture in my notes. It says this, Acts 17, 11, again, a, a, a familiar verse says, these, and uh, speaking of the Bereans, these, the Bereans, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily, search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So they searched the scriptures daily. <clears throat> and uh, I think most of us have the same attitude about the Bible. We like to daily open the Bible and study it. Uh, it uh, gives us a send off in the day, uh, reading God's word and understanding what God has to say to us. 
So the second rule I would like to bring out is always remember the big picture when confronted with difficult verses. You know, we have an advantage over most people that read the Bible because we understand what it's all about. We know that uh, we know that God is building a family. We know that there's going to be a kingdom here on earth. Most people don't know that, really. They they don't know that. They, uh, you know, they say they think something like you're going to heaven and float around on a cr cloud or something like that. I, I don't know exactly what they do believe, but we believe something that's really going to happen. And uh, most Christians think one of their jobs is to save the world. Uh, we know that's not possible. We're not, we're not supposed to try to save the world. We can't do it. God has to call those that he's saving right now. The world's time is coming later, as all of you know. So let's, uh, let's look at a difficult scripture and uh, <clears throat> see how this applies. Turn to Luke 17. And verse and was begin in verse twenty. Luke Luke seventeen verse twenty says Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, here it is, see here, or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So he says the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I think almost all of you can see that there's a problem with that verse, the way it's stated. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he tells the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you. And uh, we know that just can't be. So I, I kind of broke out the three errors that we, we can see. Number one, it seems to say the kingdom of God is already here. It says it's within the, it's, it's within the people, in this case, the Pharisees. And number two, it seems to say the coming of the kingdom is a secretive event. Uh, we know that that's not true. It's true it's coming suddenly and un unexpectedly. That's true, but it's not coming uh, secretly. It comes with the sound of a great trumpet. And we know that. If we, we could quote verses that talk about the trumpet. It's going to sound when uh, Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. And number three, it seems to say the kingdom of God is in the hearts of the Pharisees. I mean, I suppose you could you could say, well, maybe the where it says the kingdom of God is within you, you could be a, a general word, meaning it's in human beings, not the Pharisees, but it's in human beings uh, per se. But that's not true either. Because the kingdom of God is not here now. It's not in, it's not in our hearts. The kingdom of God is not, not in our hearts and minds. The laws of God might be there, written there, but not the kingdom itself. The kingdom is not here now, and we know that. So we know that that verse is, uh, has problems, doesn't it? it? It just has problems. So one thing we can do is is to find a, uh, see if there are any translations that translate it in a, in a more logical way. And there is a, there is a Bible called the NASB, the, uh, the NASB is highly respected by those who speak Greek and understand Greek. Uh, a lot better than you and I do. Here's the way it, it, it translates this. It says, now having been questioned by the Pharisees 
as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. And, and to the general public, that's true. It's not, there are no signs that people can observe that it's coming. We can see it coming in a, in a sense. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst, is in your midst. Now, that Greek word, I, I, didn't, I didn't break it out and, and uh, tell you what it is and all of that. I don't know how effective that is. But it, can it be within something? Yes, it can. So it's not exactly a mistranslation to say it's within something, but we know that in this context, it, it just can't be. So in the midst is the only translation that works because what he's saying is Jesus is the king, and when the king is there, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, can we prove that from other scriptures? Yes, we can. Turn to Luke 10. Luke, Luke 10, just to back a ways. Luke 10, verse 1 says this. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before the face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And that, that gives the introduction. Now, now I want to, for sake of time, skip to verse 9. Well, let's read verse 8 as well. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as set before you. Verse 9 says, And heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. It didn't say the kingdom of God has come come to you, but it has come near to you. In other words, it's in their midst because these are emissaries of Jesus himself. It says the kingdom of God has come near unto you. And then he gives instructions in, in verse 10. And then verse 11, he says, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's come near to you. So we can see that the NASB was correct in translating that midst rather than within. Or you could say near. You know, you could say the kingdom of God is near you in the form of Jesus. So there we see how uh, other translations can help a great deal. Rule number three, play, pay close attention to the context. This is a very important thing. Pay, pay close attention to the context. The context makes all the difference in the world. <clears throat> There's a saying in, uh, in Bible translations that context is king. And what that means is if you find a word that seems to say one thing, but it goes against the context, context more or less overrules that dictionary meaning, and it can mean a similar meaning. So what is context? Context, people, some people think the context is read the couple of verses before and the verse in question and a couple after, and that's context. No, not really. That's not context in its complete form. <clears throat> context is who is speaking, what is the actual subject, when was it said? Where is it taking place? And why was the statement made? It, you might think, well, 
what difference does it make as to when it was said? Well, it makes a lot of difference sometimes. You know, in the first century, they had a problem with uh, uh, meat offered to idols. And uh, in the first century, uh, some someone might go into a meat market and say, is this beef, has it been offered to idols? And, and they might not want to eat it. You know, Paul taught on that, that uh, an idol is nothing, really. But uh, people would want to ask about that. And so if, if the scripture is about unclean, or if it's if scripture is about something offered to idols, we don't have to study that really hard and say, now how, how am I going to obey this, you know? I mean, it might have ramifications, but in, in its pure form, it's, uh, we don't need to be too concerned about that. Let's turn to Matthew 15. <clears throat> Matthew 15 is, uh, is a scripture that uh, people pull out of context and misunderstand the whole point. Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1, says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And uh, the, the intervening verses, which I don't want to read, uh, kind of goes on to a related subject. But I'm going to skip down to verse 10 to get to my point. Verse 10 says, When he had called the multitude, after he talked to the Pharisees, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? It goes into the stomach and is eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, or the inner workings of the man, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which should defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now, if I wanted to take the time, we could turn to uh, what is it? Mark 7, I think, which covers the same thing. But Mark 7 is difficult because it's been meddled with a little bit by translators. But this, this is plain. It was not talking about clean and unclean foods. It was talking about eating with unwashed hands. Now, from, from history and culture, we understand that the Pharisees had a ritual. They washed, they washed their hands up to the elbows thoroughly their hands and everything up to the elbows. That was a ritual. And uh, why did they do it? Well, one of the reasons they did it so people could see them and say, wow, those guys are so righteous. They're so careful. <laughs> but, you know, they wanted, they wanted to, a show was what they wanted. So anyway, other scriptures that talk about this, it, this, uh, Incident, Matthew 15, has the simple explanation. It says, if you, if you eat something that your body shouldn't have, within reason, 
the digestive system will take care of it. You know, I mean, eat a little bit of dirt, you're not going to die. And it'll be it'll be taken care of. So the next rule I'd like to uh, <clears throat> give you is to study the Bible with the proper goals in mind. Uh, you know, uh, if you study the Bible so you can argue with somebody, that's, <laughs> that's not the right goal. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not it. That's not what you need to study the Bible for. You, you know, as the... Uh, Second Timothy said it's for doctrine, reproof, and correction. By the way, reproof and correction are they sound the same, but they're a little different. Re reproof, reproof is what you're doing wrong, and the correction is how you correct it. You know, so they're two different things. And then instruction in righteousness, teaching us how to live. That's what the Bible is. A lot of the Bible is about teaching us how God wants us to live. Now there, besides those, uh, those given by Paul there, there are, other, there are other reasons we could come up with for studying the Bible. And I, I thought of five other ones and, and you could probably think of five more besides these. Number one, it draws us closer to God. When we read God's word, God is speaking to us and that draws us closer to God. In, in addition, it cr increases our faith. Romans, uh, I think it's Romans 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you read the Bible, that increases your faith, it really does. Uh, that's why you need to read the Bible every day, study the Bible every day. Another point, it increases our connection to God. When we read God's word as though he's speaking to us, it increases our connection to him. Another point, it causes us to reason and think like God. God, that's what God wants of us. He, he wants us to think like he thinks. And that really goes against human nature to think like God thinks. We think, we kind of think like human beings think. You're like, uh, what can I do to get ahead? What can I do to gain some traction or, or something? And also, uh, another one I thought of, it strengthens our disconnect from this present evil world. Strengthens our disconnect from this present evil world. And uh, if you watch the news, uh, you know I'm not kidding when I'm telling you this, this world is evil. It, it really is. It's so messed up. It's, so it's hard to describe. My last point here is to is rule number five is to use several translations and check the original language if necessary. You know, if you if you need an alternate translation, you can find almost every translation you can think about on the web, and uh, I can't necessarily tell you how to do that now, but uh, they're out there. And some translations are copyrighted, and uh, you know I have a I have a couple of Bible programs on my computer, and but but they don't have some of the copyrighted uh, translations, like the NASB is translate is copyrighted, and uh, the NIV and and a few others, but you can find them on uh, and read them online, and. What I do is I, uh, I bookmark them so I can find them if I want to consult one of those. So let me uh, conclude by just kind of rehashing what I, what I brought to you. The five points that I've given you is to, number one, treat the Bible with reverence because it is God speaking to us. Number two, always remember the big picture. 
You know, we have a big advantage over anybody else that studies the Bible in that we know the end game. We know we know the end of all of this, and we know the we know what God has in mind. That's a big advantage. It really is. Number three, make sure of the context, and I expanded on what the context really is, and study with the proper goals in mind, not to be a Mr. Wise Guy that can quote scriptures when you don't know what they mean. And number five, use several translations if needed. Sometimes you don't need other translations. You just need to do a little more study. So if, if you put these rules into effect, I think your Bible studies will be more effective and you'll find that uh, you'll get more out of your study of God's word.